Hi everybody, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and today we are going to start a new section. This is uh, section four. Section four is titled Types of Chemical Reactions and Solution Stoichiometry. So types of chemical reactions, which we'll do a little bit later on in the section, and solution stoichiometry, we're going to kind of get that started, not right away because I have to introduce water as a solvent first. And that's our first topic. So right there you see a star. That means it's our first major topic, and that's water as a solvent. So first let's define solvent, shall we? A solvent is the substance in a solution that does the dissolving. Solutions in which water is the dissolving medium are called aqueous solutions. Almost every solution that we deal with in general chemistry is an aqueous solution. So, and I've just rewritten that here in our notes for us. It says underneath aqueous solutions, in which water is the solvent, it says virtually all of the chemistry that makes life possible occurs in an aqueous environment. So most of the solutions that we'll deal with, water is the solvent. All right, the next bullet point here in our notes on page one of today's notes says, water is able to dissolve many different substances. For example, the sugar you add to iced tea, right? The sugar gets dissolved into the tea. The salt you add to soup, the salt gets dissolved by the water in the soup. We'll learn later on that sugar and salt are referred to as solutes. But the question here is, how exactly does water dissolve a substance? What's going on that makes water dissolve a substance? Well, liquid water molecules are essentially a collection of millions and millions of water molecules. All right, it's actually much more than a million, but we'll leave it at that. So the structure of water, which we'll learn about uh, later on in the course, is uh, it's, it's a tetrahedral geometry with a bent shape. But for right now, let's just look at the structure as kind of being a bent angle there with a 105 degree bond angle. So it's a bent molecule. It's V-shaped, if you will. The bond angle is 104.5. Just know that it kind of looks like a, like a boomerang for right now. And the two OH bonds are covalent bonds formed by an unequal sharing of electrons. Okay, so an unequal sharing of electrons we'll learn in later chapters or later sections. Essentially, the covalent bond is like a tug of war, tug of war between for the two electrons in the covalent bond, and oxygen's winning. So oxygen is drawing most of that electric or that um, the electrons towards itself. So the H ends of the molecule are partially positively charged, whereas the oxygen end is where the partial negative charge lies for the molecule. So on the left-hand side, you see I've written these little dipole moments, which looks like a little cross with an arrow. Those are dipole moments. But for right now, if we just look at the molecule I've drawn on the right, we can see that water is a polar molecule with most of the negative charge drawing down towards the oxygens. Okay, so the oxygen is where the negative charge is. The hydrogens are where the partially positive charge end is. All right, so we talked about what a solvent was, and that solvent is what does the dissolving. The solute is the substance that gets dissolved. Now, in general chemistry, this is usually a solid, okay? So, usually in chemistry, uh, for our purposes, the solute is the substance that gets dissolved, and the solvent is the substance that does the dissolving, and that's usually water. Okay, so when a solid, in other words, a solute, dissolves in water, water being our solvent, the new solute solvent interactions are replacing 
the previous solute solute interactions. All right, so a solute solute interaction is basically like a hunk of sugar or um, some grains of salt that you want to dissolve. So it says again, when a solid or solute dissolves in water, water being our solvent, the new solute solvent interactions are replacing the former solute solute interactions which have been holding the solid together. As an example, H2O molecules interacting with the positive and negative ions of a salt. So you got to be patient with me here as I draw a little salt crystal. All right, the minus you can consider to be like the Cl minus ion, the chloride ion, and the smaller little plus ion maybe is an Na plus ion if we were talking about table salt, NaCl. Could be anything though. I've drawn it in a one to one ratio, so it could be LiCl, it could be NaBr. Um, just think of it as like NaCl for right now. Now, this is a three dimensional crystal, right? And that's why I've got the arrows showing it goes on and on. It's like a big uh, crystal lattice of Na pluses and Cl minuses. And when we add water to this three dimensional salt compound, the positive end of the water molecule, the hydrogen ends, are going to gather around the minus ion, whereas the, in the other one, the plus ion, the Na plus ion, is being surrounded by the oxygen ends of the water molecules. And then what happens is we slowly break apart the salt crystal, and that process is called hydration um, or solvation. For water, we use hydration. All right, page three of our notes. It says, most polar substances dissolve in water. And you notice that water is also a polar substance. So polar substances dissolve in water, whereas most nonpolar substances do not dissolve in water. A lot of ionic compounds are going to dissolve in water for that reason. All right. All right, whole new topic. I'm just going to introduce it here. It's uh, strong and weak electrolytes. Uh, first, some background information on electrolytes, okay? We need to consider what happens when a solute gets dissolved by a solvent. In other words, we need to consider what happens when a solute gets dissolved by water, water being our solvent. So, very, sim very simply put, solute plus solvent makes a solution. All right, and a solution can be a strong electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, or a non-electrolyte. And a solution is just, it's uniform throughout. We learned about this in section one. It's a homogeneous mixture, and it's a solute that's been dissolved by a solvent. So how do we know if it's a strong electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, or a non-electrolyte? How do we know that about our solution that we just made? Well, aqueous solutions can conduct electricity. Um, in, in the case of strong electrolytes, these are solutions that conduct electricity very efficiently. Like if you had a light bulb, right, with the two prongs, the two electrodes, and you put it in a uh, strong electrolytic solution, the charge carriers there, all the ions, would light the light bulb really well. Now, weak electrolytes, they conduct electricity, but they only collect electricity to, um, to a certain extent. So weak electrolytes are solutions that conduct electricity only sparingly. In other words, if you had a light bulb with the two electrodes and you stuck the light fixture into the, or the light, the two probes into a weakly electrolytic solution, the bulb would only light a little bit, a dim light, because there's not as many charge carriers or ions uh, completing that circuit. And then you have non-electrolytes, number three. These are solutions that permit no current flow whatsoever. These are things like sugar solutions. They do not conduct electricity. Well, in all three of those cases, water was the solvent, right? Hmm, so it's not the solvent's problem. 
something must be going on with the solute here, right? It's the solute is responsible for whether or not something is electrolytic. So in all three cases, water is the solvent. So electrical conductivity depends on the solute. All right, now in our next video, we'll take a closer look at strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, non-electrolytes, and then how these solutes end up being charged carriers. All right, so that's it for this short video, and I hope you have a good day. Thanks.